the speaker, I'd like to make a couple of program announcements. First of all, um, we have recently added a river program on the San Juan to our, our series of programs, and that's going to take place in June, and it's a geology and natural history river trip on the upper part of the San Juan from Sand Island down to Mexican half. is going to be Lon Abbott. I don't know if some of you were here for his uh, presentation on the incision history of the Grand Canyon last year at about this time. But it was remarkable, and he's a remarkable instructor. And then the other uh, leader of the trip is going to be our executive director, Tom Fleischner. So if you're interested in the trip, there's information out in the lobby about that trip. And speaking of trips, there's also a um, Gulf of California trip that we have coming up in May, and there's still a few seats left in that as well. So I encourage you to sign up or talk to me about either one of those trips, or Tom, or our charming office manager, Pat Zemer. And I would be remiss, and Pat would be mad at me, 
if I did not you tell you <laughs> to also, if you're not on our email list, sign up for it, and you can do that in the lobby as well. Um, another first for us tonight is that this is being live streamed, and so we're also going to record it and put it on our website for others to look at in the future. And so we intend to continue to do this in the future. And uh, so welcome to all you out there in Cyberlandia. And uh, I also want to thank Rob Milligan. He is the executive director of the Prescott Media Center. And that's a, a, a not-for-profit, community-oriented um, media center. So if you have interests aligned with those kind of uh, services, I encourage you to chat with Rob. He's, he's, he's a genius. So, <laughs> show up in the fossil record about 400 million years ago. And they've been a force ever since. They're among the first organisms to colonize land, terrestrial habitats. The first creatures to fly, and incredibly successful. As a matter of fact, my daughter, who's an insect biology major, told me very recently that there are more insects, more species in one family of beetles than all vertebrate life on Earth. So they indeed have been very successful. And 400 million years is a long time. <laughs> long enough to develop some complex, bizarre, and beautiful interspecific relationships. Tonight, we have the great pleasure of looking deeply into a remarkable set of relationships found locally, and we could ask for no better guide into a world insecta than Peter Sherman. Peter is an ecolog ecologist specializing in the tropical lowland rainforest. Peter has published scientific articles on slave raiding ants in the Chiricahua Mountains of Arizona, the economics of bed building spiders in upstate New York, the distribution of alligators in Texas swamps and the effects of giant land crabs on plant diversity in Costa Rica's, one of course, Costa Rica's national parks. Peter received his PhD in Rainforest Systems Ecology from the University of Michigan in 1997. And he's been a professor and chair of the Master of Arts program in Environmental Studies at Prescott College since 2005. Would you join me in giving Peter a warm welcome? I've gotten that job. And I, I looked over at somebody's door, Howard Topoff's door, it just so happens, and he and I saw slave writing ants. I had just done a paper on slave writing ants in my senior year, so I was very excited about it. Knocked on the door. He happened to know, I think my dad might be live streaming right now. He knew my dad because my dad was on the radio in New York City. And so he said, before I even asked him, he said, You got the job. You want a job? I got a job for you. <laughs> and so real first interview. I landed a job 10 minutes later with some guy who never heard of me. I never heard of him except I had cited his papers, etc. And so a few weeks later, in one of his trucks, this is one part of the deal, driving to Arizona to, to, to the Chiricahuas to begin what would turn out to be my introduction into biology, field biology. Then, as you can imagine my surprise when we come to Prescott, and I'm looking in the backyard with the kids who are up here. You saw them a little while ago. This is a few years ago now. And I noticed a raid going on, and I knew, and I recognized the ants, and I knew exactly what we were looking at. I had no idea that these ants live right here. So all the photographs that I'm showing you tonight that are mine, another one listed, don't, don't have a, a, a citation next to them indicating that they're somebody else's are from Mountain Club. So there you have it. Uh, I actually didn't take that photo either. <laughs> so let us dive down deeper into the world of this particular ant, Polyergus breviceps, and the kind of the 
The folksy title of this talk is, There's a Lot Going On in Your Backyard, Whether You Know It or Not. And we're talking about here the slave raiding ants. Now, these have been studied. There are four species of polyergus, and they've been, they're all what are called obligatory parasites. That means they are obligated to parasitize their hosts, and they cannot survive otherwise. So 200 years ago, 210 years ago, when the first paper was written, it was, they were using the term slave raiding at that time. Clearly, that's a, in, an inappropriate term by modern day uh, awareness. But these are called brood parasites. And as brood parasites, brood meaning they parasitize another species of ants and take their, their young. So that's what we'll be talking about. So if I slip into the language of the slave raiding ants, uh, forgive the, uh, the unacceptable language, but uh, that's, it's kind of lodged in my brain. I'll do my best to stay clean. So we're looking at the slavery ants, their hosts, in other words, the animals that they are parasitizing, and the parasites that I determined, I learned by just photographing and then looking at the pictures and seeing what I saw, you'll see in a moment, that there are parasites that parasite, parasitize the parasites. So that's what we're talking about today. So if we take a look here, this ant distinguishes itself, the genera distinguishes itself, from others by those mandibles. These mandibles are so large in the world of ants and so uh, uniquely shaped in those sickle cell or scimitar, I guess sickle cell would be a better use of the term, sickle cell uh, shape that they are unable to do much of anything. These ants cannot uh, build a nest. They can't improve a nest. They can't take care of their young. They can't forage. They can't feed one another. They can't take care of their queen. They can't do much of anything, except they're very good at killing other things. And so that turns out to be their niche. So here's some other photos of that same ant. And here's a shot uh, from the backyard, and I'll, we'll be talking in a moment. A close-up. You'll see that my shots are not professional because I was just kind of ran out, ran inside, grabbed as whatever I could. No extra lighting, no other anything. But you'll see. But this is a close-up of that. Here's an ant right over here, just to see again. You can see that sickle-shaped the the mandibles of these ants. Very powerful, very effective at killing, and not a whole lot else. However, many of you know of red ants in your yards or nearby. And the red ants I suspect you're thinking of are probably these, Oganomermics. And I'm not sure of the species around here. If somebody knows, please speak out. Occidentalis is the one that I think is around here. By the way, before we get going any further, I am open to any and all questions during the talk. If I feel that I should delay the question, I'll just be very straight with you. I'm from New York. I'm very, uh, I'm not timid about that sort of thing. So just uh, ask your questions, and I will, I'll navigate from there. So, Pogoda Mermix, you might recognize. You see this nest right here in the center? This is their nest. You might see it also more elevated, something like this. These are all nests of Pogoda Mermix. We have about three of them in our yard. You probably have several in your yard as well. And here, just for identification purposes, uh, this is Pogoda uh, Mermix, this is Polyergus. Clearly different ants. These are the harvester ants. These are the ones that go out and collect seeds. A woman named Deborah Gordon at Stanford has done some amazing work with them studying their behavior, their foraging choices, etc., and their, their colony approach. But uh, polyergus doesn't do any of that stuff. Polyergus is very quiet and meek during the day, and then in the afternoon, everything shifts on certain afternoons. So here's polyergus again. Again, here is Pogono Mermex. Uh, from, and these are the two animals you can see quite different. You see the hairs over here. You see a much more robust body shape, a square head. This is a much more kind of uh, wasp-like looking animal, much more delicate composed, compos uh, construction. So let's talk about the raid and how it proceeds. And we'll start with the scouts. And so 
I didn't exactly know what my job was going to be when I was given that job on the fly. It turns out I was going to walk in circles for a summer. I wasn't sure, but I was only too happy to do it because it was in the Kirakau Mountains. And if you're going to, as a 22-year-old or whatever, walk in circles, that's a really good place to do it. <laughs> so imagine this is a nest. It actually is a nest uh, of, Pogono, of polyergis. And you'll see here a black ant, which is one of the formica, the ge another genera. And this is one of the slaves or workers of this, of the otherwise red ant nest. And the nest is uh, diminutive, not um, much of something that you could notice easily. And my job was to walk in circles around it all day long, and which I loved, by the way. And, uh, and now this circle, for the, because of the confines of that photograph, is quite narrow. My, my radius was about seven meters, so just to give you an idea. And what I was doing was I was told to find the scouts. We understood, the man I was working with, Howard Topoff, was one of the leading experts on these ants. And he knew that all of this raid started with scouts. And, but he wanted to understand more about the scouts, and that's what we were there to do. So I walked around that area, and when I saw a scout coming by, I would paint it so that we knew what the scout, that that was the scout. Because otherwise, they're indistinguishable, but morphologically or I can't distinguish between them. I'm sure they can. And so what I would do is, if there was a yellow scout, if there was a scout heading off in that direction, I might paint it yellow. I had multiple colors there. As another scout was heading off in a different direction, I would paint that one white. And we did this with all the scouts that we would see, and we began a process of studying all these scouts. And so what we then started to look for was where were these scouts going? How are they going? How are they navigating? These were some of our questions. And with the polyergus nest here on the left side, with the formiga, remember this is the host, this is the parasite, and the distance between the nests varies. For example, in my own yard, one of the, one of the nests was probably about 10 meters away. In other words, the formica nest was about 10 meters away from the polyergus nest. In, so also in our yard, another one of the formica nests that we found, and the only reason we found is because we followed the raid, was uh, about 100 meters away. They go at even further as well. So here's what the ant basically does. It begins a very, it has kind of a two-phase process. It goes out in a certain cardinal direction, relatively straight, nothing, they're not too uptight, you know, they do their thing. And then once they get out to a certain distance, and we don't know what the cue is, they start to move in a radically different position, a maneuver, like this. Now, the formica nest has formic, formica ants in it, and you might recognize the name formica from formic acid. And the smell that the ants give off during their, during their daily procedure, as well as during a raid, is a very powerful, distinctive smell of formic acid. So it's possible that once the ant, the polyergist scout, recognizes the smell of the formic acid in the region, it starts a whole new process of looking for the nest. Once it finds that nest, it makes basically a bee line or an ant line, I guess, back to the polyergist nest. And it's a relatively straight return, despite the fact that this whole section can be quite convoluted. So we wondered, how did the scouts navigate? So what do you think are some of the hypotheses we developed? No. Scent. Scent is one. What's another? I'm oh, sorry? They're feelers. Feelers, OK. They're feelers are, in this case, probably, or we would have hypothesized, working with scent, trying to, because they're moving hundreds of meters. What else? Any other ideas? Mapping. Mapping. They're doing some mapping, but it's, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So let's talk about scent first. With scent, the ants were basically going like this. The scout on the way home from the form of the nest would come, we would be watching it, the little yellow painted ant, coming home from the form of the nest, making a move. And we would, and the hypothesis was that as it was going, it was laying a scent trail behind it. So what we did was anticipating where, this is also part of my job, which I also loved, 
anticipating where that ant was going to be coming back from, what we did was we put uh, we put um, a big piece of, of cardboard, or it was wood in some cases, underneath the dirt and then piled dirt on top of it. And so we were able to take that cardboard while the ant was <laughs> while the ant was away, and we took their we took its a uh, scent trail, if there was a scent trail, and we made it perpendicular to the original scent trail. <laughs> and so what we were hypothesizing, and we saw many times, but not enough for us to feel confident that scent was all that was going on, we would watch, I'm sorry, let me go back. We would watch the ant return to the nest, and it would go in there and do things that we didn't understand because we weren't able to see for about 20 minutes. And then out from the nest would pour the entire red colony of red ants, which down in the Chiricahuas meant a few hundred thousand ants. Now up here at our diminutive nest, it was probably closer, it was in the hundreds. But nevertheless, and so we would then watch that return to the other nest, and when it hit that, when it hit this scent trail, it would go in the direction of the scent trail, now, accidentally, because of our manipulation, going the wrong direction. It would then mill up the whole, the whole colony would come to a grinding halt over <laughs> here, wondering what to do, until one of them would find the trail again and, and continue. So we saw this a few times. Yes? Was the scout with them, or did he stay with them? We'll talk about that in just a second. Very good question. Now, other ways in which they might navigate, as you were suggesting, the mapping, are they, they well, the, the great, the power top off's primary hypothesis at this point is that they're using polarized light and to some degree images of the canopy that they memorize. And we also did this by putting black cloth over the ants and controlling the direction of light with artificial lights, but that was a little hard because we were out in the woods. But we also did other uh, attempts like that. So this is still, as far as I know, an unanswered question as to exactly how they are uh, <coughs> navigating in terms of the scout. Robert? Are you talking about polarized light reflecting off the canopy? Polarized light coming, yeah, coming through the canopy and, and uh, distributing itself in such a way. So, uh, so, this, is, so this is possibly, uh, this is uh, an imagination, uh, a, a dramatization. Uh, of what an ant might be seeing as it walks through the forest. So. Now, so let's talk about the raid. The raid, as I suggested, was influenced, not only was led by the scout. So how do we know that the scout was the one truly in the lead? And so, you know what, this looks starting to look like a video. It is a video. <laughs> Because why would I take a picture of that if it's not a video? <coughs> oh, this is not this is not manipulated in time, and this is just me with my handheld camera. So forgive me, quality. And this is a small ray by their standards. <laughs> You know, I'm having flashbacks right now. Because <laughs> when I was 22 and still really stupid about such things, National Geographic came to film this, and they asked me to be their assistant. And so I was only too happy to oblige. It turns out my job was to hold the lighting, you know, the, the reflective lighting and other things, and then hold the camera. And they wanted the image of the of the raid coming over the lens of the camera. <laughs> so we dressed up completely, and we, we put cotton in our ears, we had goggles on, we plugged up our noses, we did everything, and then thousands of these ants crawled all over me because I was the one who said yes. <laughs> this is another video based on that. <laughs> did we just see this? Did you freak out when they were crawling on the yeah. No, I was super at ease about it. But it hurt. <laughs> okay, I think that was the previous video. So, so remember that we painted these scouts. So how do we know that the scout is in the lead? 
What is one really easy, low-tech approach as a researcher? How might you go about um, figuring out whether the scout is the leader of this raid? Is he in front of me? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, that's even easier than I was thinking about. That. <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> If we were both working together, I wouldn't be fired. <laughs> so what else is another approach? Removing. Oh, yes, so we do those things. We remove the ants. We remove the scouts while they go out to see if the colony will raid without a scout coming back. We return the scout because we're like this. We return the scout at the end of the day, and so they presume, we presume, that, the, that it was just a failed scouting effort. They come back to their nest. Or we, uh, or we remove the scouts and see if the, the trail can continue. Another approach is this. We just stuck a cup over it. <laughs> and the entire raid, remember this is about this thick, and it goes for maybe 20 yards or so, and it's just filled with ants, so lots and lots of ants. And the whole thing comes to a grinding halt <laughs> until we lift the cup up and boom, it take off again. <laughs> so a little simple stuff like that allowed us to get some insight into some examples. So let's talk now about the raid itself. Another video, I believe. I wonder how to work this. Does somebody know how to work this? <laughs> Make sure you press the play and not the back button. Is that enough? That's enough. Um, you don't. What if I just click on this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This arrow? <laughs> this arrow? Yeah, it's a space bar. Oh. No, that takes us to the next video. Oh, here's an arrow. No. Any ideas? That's <laughs> 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 Somebody's laughing like they know what I'm not doing right. <laughs> Could you tell me what I'm not doing? Just go up mess around. Nope, too much. This, like there? Top of the play button. You don't see that? Okay, good. So it's color. No, no, no. It turns yellow. Oh, I can see it here. Oh, I'll look there next time. So this is taken in Mountain Club here in Prescott. No, it's not speeded up, sped up. If, uh, if I play the sound, I'll hear a chicken in the background. <laughs> yeah, that's why they're hard to photograph. Is that actually speed? When the pros are photographing them, they have them in a lab, and they have with, and it's like a cool, like a 20, a 40 degree lab. Is that video speeded up? No, it's not. Uh, what I could do is, uh, if I could find the sound, Look here this time. Um, well, you'll just have to trust me that it's not. I turned off the sound earlier because it's just a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so here's. So. How do you get the dot on the ant if you're moving it? I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. How do you get the dots on the ant? Oh, with a little paintbrush. <laughs> And we, it took us about two weeks to find the right paint. It's like, as I recall, it's like model. The people who use paint for models and stuff. And and when and it only lasts a little while because the ants will groom it off. And that that was the question I had in terms of the effect uh, on their behavior because it would be an extra weight. Sure. Like if, if I have something stuck on my skin, I would right. notice. It. Does it affect their behavior that period? We couldn't tell. I'm sure it does, but we couldn't tell. Yeah. It certainly didn't affect their ability to scout yeah. and their ability to lead a raid. Yeah. They're so fast. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're very fast. So the question is, how do you paint them when they're so fast? And not just going to make a big mess of everything. Uh, we would generally stick them into a little petri dish or something with a little hole strategically placed and paint them that way, and then release them, and they went off and did their thing. So, as they get close to the nest, here's an example of a raid that got to where the scout led the, the raid, but then there was no nest at the other end.
Uh, again, not, not, not sped up. In fact, I tried to slow them down, but I didn't have the machinery to do it. So what they're doing is they're all scouring the area. You can see it's not an organized raid. They're looking for the nest. Now here's what's happening while this is happening. Let's assume for the moment that in this scene, where there was no formica nest, that there was a formica nest. Let's imagine that for a moment. Here's what the formica are doing. The moment that they, they have their scouts out looking as well, and when one of their scouts finds one of the polyergists, the scout or one of the, the raiders coming back, they start squirting that formic acid. And the smell becomes so strong that if there was a nest in this room, all of us would smell this. It's a very powerful smell, a very distinctive smell. And the formica ants respond very quickly, very definitively. They run into their nest and they grab their children and they run for the hills. They, they're each grabbing a child uh, like a pupa, and they're running to hide. Out the main doorway? Or out the, yeah, if they've got multiple doorways, I'm sure they're using them. But the, we watch the main doorway, and that's what we see. They are running, and that, and that begins the process of this uh, experience. Now here <coughs> is another. This is now a raid. This is not sped up. You'll start to see them pulling out the black ants. The black ants are, are a formidable species, but not against these folks. Those pincers can, can pierce, and they use them in that way. And there's not a whole lot that the formica nest can do. There are very, this is a very small uh, formica nest, and ultimately didn't have any brood, but it was one that I was able to photograph. Is there any toxin in the picture? Is there any toxin in the picture? Not that we know. So this, so let me just show you a few of these pictures from the raid. These are still photos of that raid, and then I'll show you. Well, so here's um, here's one of the black ants that is fighting. Uh, it's not going to make it, but this is one of the black ants out, just outside the nest fighting. Here's another ant that is being pulled out of the nest. Let me, am I black? No. Pulled out of the nest. Um, here it is. You can see it's being pinched uh, up on the, uh, on the thorax there. Um, and here being really uh, quite, uh, and that's a close-up of this. And they start to pull out more and more of these ants. And the black ants, as you can see here, of uh, some of the damage done right there. I think I did, yeah, I indicate that. Uh, so this is uh, some of the, these ants are, just don't have a chance. So, and they're pulling them out one by one. Uh, some of them they're tearing apart, some of them they're not. And what they're, what they're really doing is they're looking for the brood, and we'll get to that in a moment. And you can start to see some of the dead ants are being piled up over here. And they're starting to bring them out and pile them up. And these are all, of course, photos from town, here in town. Now, there was one thing I didn't, we didn't know about, I didn't know about, and, and it's this. You see that animal? It's carrying something, a little, little piece of, of, you know, rock. And I didn't know that they were so capable of doing this. They certainly don't do it at home when they have all the other workers, the black workers, doing their work for them, the formica workers. But here, uh, they were able, they demonstrate they, they are able to manipulate uh, the debris. And they were just pulling it out probably as a matter of uh, some sort of instinctual effort. Take a look at this. I didn't know, what, I don't understand what's happening there. This appears to be a different uh, cast of ant, but the polyergist doesn't have more than two castes. They have the, the worker soldiers, and they have the queens and the kings. And so I don't know what's going on there. And I'm trying to reach Howard Topoff, because he certainly will, my, that mentor of mine. Uh, so here you can see that there's a red ant that's been killed, and it's been brought out as well, and the black ant also killed. <coughs> but here's what also is happening. They're, well, the main purpose of their efforts is to get the brood. 
The red ants are going for the black ant brood, the formica brood, because what they're going to do is they're going to bring the black ant brood back from the black ant nest, back to the red ant nest, and in there, the other black ants that are currently there, the adult black ants that are in the red ant nest, will take care of the black ant brood that are brought in. They'll take care of them because that's what they do. When the black ants get closed, when they emerge, they will be confronted with what every ant, as far as I know in the world, is confronted with, having to identify this place as home. They do that with an olf olfactory. So as soon as the ants emerge from their pupae in the wrong nest, they smell the nest around them and adopt it as their own. And this becomes their nest that they will defend, that they will work for, that they will build, that they will tend the queen, tend the other ants, go forage. They do all that work exactly as they are pre-programmed, just in the wrong nest of the wrong gender. And so here they are pulling, bringing home some of the uh, pupae. So they never, they never bring back a live slave ant? No. Many of these will be eaten. <coughs> Many of the pupae will be eaten. Oh. And uh, the rest of them will be raised. So are the adult black ants uh, previous pupae? Yes. Yeah. So, so the question is, are the adult black ants that are in the red ant nest previously stolen pupae? And the answer is yes. So who took care of the first one? Ah, <laughs> did you hear that? Who took care of the first one? We'll get to that later. Okay, so here you might see, this is an interesting scene because this is kind of the refuse pile of the black ant nest. You can see some of the stuff they've been eating, and here's the red ant, net, the red ant stealing one of the black ant pupae. Again, shots of them stealing the pupae. You saw how fast they move. That explains in part why it's so difficult to photograph them, unless you cool them down, unless you have them in a lab. And so here's some professional shots. Uh, and this might be somewhat manipulated because this is not exactly the sort of pupae that they would bring out. But nevertheless, uh, this is uh, some other scene of shots of those scenes. Mm -hmm. Alex Wilde is a taxonomist who does uh, some great photography. Uh, a lot of it, as you can see, uh, in the lab. Lighting, special lighting. So back at the polyergist nest, here it is. These are the polyergist uh, ants being tended to by their black ant reformica workers. And it's a, it is, these are, to be very clear, the host, and these are the parasites, even though this is all happening in, the, in, the, in their nest. And as mentioned earlier, just to be super clear about it, every one of these ants was brought here as a pupae. It emerged in the red ant nest, smelled for the first time what its home was, and adopted it as its own, and began doing what they were genetically predetermined to do. So, but it gets more complicated. <laughs> Here's a definition of a parasite, an organism that lives, lives in or on or somehow relies upon another <coughs> organism. An obligatory parasite would be one that, is, is, that relies upon the other host, the organism. A facultative parasite would be one that can live with or without, doesn't need the host. It benefits from the host, but doesn't need it. A epiparasite is a secondary parasite or a parasite that parasitizes the parasite. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about here. So while these folks were being pulled out, I think this is a video. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna show you the full video. It goes very fast. I couldn't find software that would slow it down. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna show you, see if you see something interesting happen besides what you see. Oh, there you <laughs> Have, it's about one second long. Did anyone see that? Is that rock? No? Okay, I will show you. I, I, I really wanted to slow this down, but I couldn't. 
There's a chicken in the background. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see, this is the way. All right, let me stop that. Because the next one, the next one is a shortened version of it. Okay, I'm gonna, we might have to play this a few times. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to look right around here, and I'm going to tell you when. Okay, remember looking at right about now. Did you see that? There's a fly. Just a fly, right? But not just any fly. So uh, take a look. Take a look at the rock here. Now I'll show you some stills so you can see it. Yeah. So that's where you're looking, right? That's the fly. I immediately knew what it was because I work in the rainforest and we have a lot of these down there. They're called forid flies. P H O R I D forid. And the forid flies are parasites of ants. And what this forward fly is trying to do is lay an egg inside one of the ants so its larva can live off the slowly dying ant and eating it from the inside out, essentially, and then emerge as an adult fly. And so take a look here. This is, uh, so what's about to happen is here's the fly trying to make its way through. I do not know whether this fly is attempting to attack the polyergus or the formica ants inside. I don't know the answer. And so here is this ant about to uh, confront that fly. And you can see it over here as it begins the confrontation. And then the fly flies very fast. So it just zooms over to the other side. The ant turns around to confront it again. And then this, watch this ant. Oh, watch this ant. Right here, who is th this is the same ant now who is guarding this nest, and here's the fly <laughs> attempting to get in. So watch this interaction between them. Am I blocking? <coughs> there's the ant. Let me just show you. There, I'm sorry. There's the fly. Can you see it? It's yeah. unfortunately the stick was there, but this is real world stuff. <laughs> here's the ant now starting to respond to the fly who is again in that same location. And here's the ant now uh, trying to repel that fly. And the fly moves away as the ant looks upwards to where it probably flew off to. The ant comes out. The fly moves up here. This is that cemetery area. Comes over towards the cemetery. Starts checking it out. And the ant comes over to see what's going on. Checks in on these two. Here's the fly, of course. The fly comes in closer, here's the living ant. And the living ant starts moving over towards that fly. You can see the fly is really starting to move in close to see if this is a worthy uh, place for it to lay its eggs. Now take a look at this. I'll show you in a second what that is. Um, but this is happening here. This was another fly, uh, ant. I don't know what kind of ant that was. It just got mixed up in the in the rain. Probably was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the ant is moved, the fly moves in there, checks that out as a possible place to lay its eggs. The ant is running over to it. All of this is happening in about 15 seconds, right? And then the ant picks up from here and flies around. Uh, flies around essentially to here where the nest is. And there's the fly inside the nest, and it goes inside the nest. That's the fly inside the nest heading in. Here's a picture of the of one of, there are many, many species of this fly. Here's just one of them. Let's see if this will work. You know if there's a chance? Well, it's a picture of a forage fly uh, attacking the ants and laying its egg inside one of the uh, one of the places where it can get in with its ovipositor, and then the larva starting to develop inside the ant. Now I knew about forage flies because I spent a lot of time in the rainforest. And those of you who have been there know that Atta, A-T-T-A, the leaf harvester ants, the leaf cutter ants, who, you know those guys? They're the ones who go out by the millions and collect leaves to bring back in fungal farm. 
They farm fungus and eat the fungus. So you probably know some of that story. But you might, they have multiple, many casts in that type of ant. Not just one cast, but many casts. And this animal up here is one of the same species, and it's a cast. It's called a hitchhiker. While these ants are doing all the work of cutting out the leaf and then dragging it back, oftentimes quite a distance, to its home, this ant is just hanging out on top of the leaf for the ride. Taking the ride the whole way. <laughs> Nobody knew what that was doing for a while until they started to realize that these ants get hit pretty hard by the forehead flies if these ants are not there to protect them. So these hitchhikers, this is a cast developed to protect these uh, leaf cutters from, from, this, uh, pro from the forehead fly. That's a pretty significant adaptation to actually develop a cast to protect oneself. Robert, so are these flies laying their eggs um, in dead ants or live ants or both? The question is, are the flies laying their, laying their eggs in dead or living ants? And the answer to the best of my knowledge is living ants. Uh, and they would, they would lay them in one of the areas where they can get in into underneath the exoskeleton and then depending on whether it's laid in the head or in the, in the, the back of the ant, uh, it will determine as to whether or not it's going to be feeding off the mandibular uh, muscles or off the so, so whatever's why, in the back. So why did the fly was fly checking out the dead ants in the previous? Um, not, the question is why was the fly checking out the dead ants? And I, I think it was the whole thing was happening in 15 seconds. I think it was just being opportunistic. Now, foreign flies are also famous in the story of, of fire ants. This is Solenopsis invicta. This is the fire ant that was imported accidentally from Brazil into Texas and is, and is a real scourge for ranchers and others in Texas. These ants are so aggressive that cows giving birth to baby cows, uh, are those baby cows are vulnerable to these ants that can attack and kill the, the cow. These are remarkably uh, aggressive and, and powerful ants that are changing the landscape down there in many respects. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stories about them, but the one interesting thing is, so they, they say, how is it possible that we didn't know that this ant was such an aggressive ant? Why have we not heard about this ant where, from where it comes from? So they went down to where it comes from, which is Brazil, in the forest, and they found these ants to be demure and docile, and generally nocturnal, and spending their time just coming in, very small nests coming out little by little, very timid, same species. They took those timid ants and they could, and they could protect them from forward flies which lived down in Brazil, and they could become, over time, much more aggressive. But the forward flies keep them at bay. When they were brought accidentally up to Texas, the forward fly uh, because it was, uh, uh, coincidentally was not similarly brought up. And so they were released from their parasite. And as such, they started to express another side of their, quote, personality, unquote, that had yet, yet not been known. So this is a big deal. So now, a guy named Larry Gilbert at the University of Texas was working to get permission to bring the forehead flies up to Texas. Which is a very risky thing to do. You, however, the argument was made, we already had the calamity. How much worse could it get? And, uh, and, uh, but that's ongoing. But they, you can, they were very careful. This was uh, done in labs that were sealed five, six times from the outside, etc. Anyway, so let me ask you some questions. Robert, you caught me earlier. If a polyergus queen cannot start a nest like a normal respectable ant or tend to her own brood, then how does this obligatory parasitical species persist? Let me be more specific. How does a polyergus queen establish a colony? What do you think? I don't have photos for this section. It's just going to be in the chest. Huh? Takes over an abandoned nest. Takes over an abandoned nest? Of, of who? Other ants. Other ants. Good song. guess. Yeah, Chris. Uh, when they leave to start a colony, they might bring some to go with them. 
Oh, when they leave to start a colony, bring some pupa with them. Good guess, they didn't come up with that solution, but that would that would have worked. Now, maybe it would have worked. If they left with a whole bunch of workers and pupa, then the workers could start the nest. But they'd have to bring the uh, formica ants with them. They couldn't do it on their own. So yeah, that, 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 what else? What other approaches might they take? There's only one queen, right? Oh, uh, no, there, well, one queen that's reproductive, but when they, re but at some point in their life cycle, the nest will produce multiple immature queens. They have wings and they fly and disperse. They also produce multiple males, not at the same time. They also fly and disperse. The female queens will attempt to mate with a male queen from another nest, all polyergis, and then she will be a mated queen. What a normal, self-respecting queen of another species would do is then, once she's been mated and she can store all the sperm of the male or males with whom she mates, she could then go on her own, start digging a hole, build a nest, lay a couple of eggs, tend to her brood, raise those few babies, and those babies start to work. They build the nest a little bit bigger. They tend to more of her eggs. She stops doing so much of the work. She starts doing more of the reproduction. Workers, as they grow in numbers, start to do more and more of the work for the nest. That's how a normal queen would do it. But this queen can't do any of those things. So how does she do it? So this is part of the work we did as well. We noticed this happening. During a raid, all the formica ants are all over the place. It's a pandemonium. And we noticed that the female queens would fly in to the raid site. They would flap their wings in a stick. They would rock, climb up to a rock, flap their wings, and all of a sudden a bunch males would swarm them. She would mate with them, and when she was done, she was very much in control. When she was done, she would tear her wings off. She would then go into the nest that was being raided, the formica nest, and that's the last we saw. So we wanted to know what's going on. So what we did back then, this is 30 years ago, we dug up a whole bunch of black ant nests. We dug up a, we grabbed, we got queens, both immature and mature, and we brought them into a laboratory setting. So about 500 black ant nests, uh, I'm sorry, black ants, workers and queens. And then we would stick in a queen that was just, that had her wings on. A red ant queen that had her wings on. In other words, she had not yet mated. And then the black ants would basically attack her and that would, it would never amount to anything, much more than that. If we put into that 500 black ant nest box a red ant queen that had the wings removed, in other words, she had been mated, the following would happen. She would sort of feign death. In other words, they would attack her, they would drag her around, she wouldn't fight much, and then when she got close to the queen, the black ant queen, she would shake them off, they would attack, and she would proceed to basically steamroll through these ants. She would pierce them and throw them over her head one by one as she went through them towards the black ant queen. As soon as she got to the black ant queen, she did two things. One is she attacked the black ant queen, rolled, biting it many, many times, the black biting her many, many times. She had no chance. And the red ant queen did one other thing. We noticed that she was curling her gaster around, and we didn't. We assumed she was squirting some pheromone, some secretion. Now everybody knows. Everybody knows that the dewfarer's gland of the of the newly mated queen is hypertrophy. <laughs> that means it's a the gland enlarges with impregnation. So what we did was we took a bunch of those Poconomermix ants that have nothing to do with anything. They were not bothering anybody. We kind of bothered them. We would take them and put them into a black ant nest in, in the lab. And we would put on them one of four things. One, one of three different types of secretions from different glands or just uh, deionized water. The only secretion that had an effect 
In other words, that stopped them from getting killed by the other black ants that were attacking them was the dewflower's gland secretion. So here's what the dewflower's gland did to the ants, to the, to the Pocono mermaids that we would put in with the black ants. We also put in all sorts of things like caterpillars and, and grasshoppers, and they all had the same reaction. As soon as we put the secretions of the dewflower's gland on the animal, whatever animal it was, the black ants would run over to the, to the animal, grab it, but not attack it, pull it over towards its own brood, the black ant brood, and start grooming it. They were grooming caterpillars. They were grooming grasshoppers on top of the brood of, of their own black ant brood. So this, we, it was multiple names for it, the appeasement pheromone, uh, there were so other names for it, but it was, it was basically chemical warfare. The ant was used, the ant, if the ant started to attack those black ants at the top of the nest, needing to try to find the black ant queen, let me say that again if I made a mistake, if the red ant queen started fighting at the beginning of the nest, it would just be, a, she could nail hundreds of these animals, but there are thousands of them. She wouldn't stand a chance over the long run. But if she allowed them to drag her down into the bowels of their nest, and then when she sensed the black ant queen, she activated. She attacked the black ant queen, sprayed the dewflower's gland, caused absolute pandemonium among the black ants. They had multiple reactions. One reaction was to fight amongst each other. Another reaction was to drag her onto their brood Another one was to attack their own queen. And by the end of all of this, she had now had pierced the black ant queen, had rolled in the black ant queen so much that by the end of the event, they had dragged her onto their brood pile and were grooming her. And she had successfully created a new nest. What's going to happen now is the raid's going to finish, all the red ants are going to go home, and she will be one red ant queen with 5,000 black ants but no black ant queen. That is a reproductively dead nest. Mm -hmm. She would now start to lay eggs. Her eggs would be mixed with all the other black ant eggs, and they would tend to them, and gradually over time, the ratio of black ants to red ants would even out, because no new black ants were being recruited, only red ants. Once it got to a certain level, they started their raids to maintain that level over time. So that's kind of what was going on, and that's some of the work we were doing. And this is a picture of the red ant queen, newly removed wings. Uh, this is some, I don't know what the end is, I suspect it's a formica. What's the lifespan of a queen? I don't know, but years. <laughs> not, not months. Not decades. And what about the workers? Months. So that's sort of the story about the red ant, the red ants that live right here in our neighborhood. And so, uh, if you'd like, we could. I'll take any all questions. Yeah. Uh, I'll repeat so, the questions. So, besides four the ants, do they uh, uh, Paris? Uh, do they attack uh, other types of ants or any other types of insects? They, I mean, no, the but our right, first few things, there are about 50 such species that are obligatory or nearly obligatory parasite, brood parasites, four of which are polyergus gemma. So this has, this is an example of convergent evolution in which mul this has evolved multiple independent times. So I don't know much about the other, whatever, 46 species of ants that do this. But my guess is, my understanding is, they are, whatever, they'll, they'll eat whatever the, the, the formica ants bring to them. Whatever foraging they do, that's what they're eating. And they, and they don't, they don't forage for themselves. But they don't, but they And they don't attack anybody else other than the, the species that are pre-designated 
genetically speaking or <coughs> evolutionarily speaking that they have a relationship with. Okay, so, so this the, this the, genera, uh, this particular polyandrous breviceps attacks, as far as I know, two or maybe a few other formica species. Okay. Nava, agentara, or agent, I don't know the pronunciation. I know they attack those two. I don't know if they attack m multiple others. Oh, so they wouldn't attack fire ants? So no, no. Okay. And you That's know the really, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> now, the really, the really huge nests, the, the ants like Atta, the leaf cutters, they have millions of ants. Well, if you can imagine, if you've got a, a, tra a trail going for six weeks through the rainforest in that direction, at some point you're going to come across the army ants, who also have maybe a few million. They've got a, they've got a little peace treaty. They don't mess with each other. When they are when the when the leaf cutter ants are going this direction and the army ants are crossing, they just allow them to cross peacefully. Peter. Yeah. How does the polyer just queen either create a supersedure queen or do they swarm? Say that again? How does the queen why would they make another queen? Oh yeah, she, you know she has a lifespan of maybe three or four years. And yeah, do I don't know how they do they um, most of the time, you know, they either kick her out of or bees that kick her out of swarm. So the question is how does the colony produce more queens, immature queens, or immature kings. I don't know if in the ants, um, I, Mark might know, the, in the bees, it has a lot to do with what they are fed as pupae. And there's a, a colloquialism called royal jelly. So if you're fed royal jelly as a honeybee, you turn into a queen. If you're not fed royal jelly, you don't turn into a queen. But in this situation, I don't know, I don't know the answer. Do you? Maybe diets related to growth. Um, Mark Rigner knows a lot more than <laughs> I do. Uh, thinks it might possibly be diet related. The question is, how does how does the polyer just know to produce more foods? Now, the swarming you call it swarming, but for example, termites. You might find this even around here. After a rain, like a spring or summer, a summer rain, you might see a bunch of flying termites. Mm -hmm. They're they're coded to go at certain kind of weather circumstances. Now, one nest of termites, if they're doing what they should be doing, is not sending both males and females simultaneously. They will stagger those so as not to uh, intrabreed. Yeah, other questions? Yes? So a polyurbis queen taking over a new colony, an immature queen that takes over a new colony, that, if I understood correctly, that's dependent on a raid. She doesn't just fly off however many hundred yards. She's dependent on a raiding party which travels 100 meters or so. The question is, does the polyurgis queen who create, who is going to create her own first new nest, is she dependent upon the raid? And we don't know the answer to that except to say that all the times we noticed it was during a raid, but that's kind of a sampling error because of course we're there because there's a raid. And oh, by the way, there's a queen as opposed to just finding a, form a peaceful formica nest out there that's where nothing's happening. And, see, and being there enough of the time, we're putting a camera on it to see if the queens enter. I don't think anyone has an answer to that. Well then, what, how, what's the distribution of polyergus? I mean, in terms of uh, where, where are they located? I mean, is it, is it something where they're almost interconnected as far as the distance between the nests, or? Oh, so if you were to look at the Poganomermix, for example, there is a tech, I, I don't, I haven't looked at this, but the distribution is clearly, they're not on top of each other. They might, they, they distribute themselves. Remember those are the harvester ants that many of us have in our yards, those big red ant uh, colonies? They're, they're distributed. They're not like clumped or something of that nature in a clump distrib distribution. So they're not related, in other words. Oh, no, no, yeah. So, but the, the polyurgis, I don't know the answer to that either. It's uh, the the polyergus are within uh, at least five or s when we were looking at them down in the Chiricahuas, which is a pretty active system, they were attacking at least ten to fifteen different formica nests. In my backyard, the polyergus nest no longer exists. I think for a couple of reasons. 
One of those scenes that I showed you the most of where the foreign fly was, that, that nest, formica nest, had no brood. At least they couldn't get any. There's probably a tiny little nest of a few hundred animals or at most. We had another nest across the street. So the raids would go across the street. And that nest was eventually kind of uh, uh, paved over slightly. We, we improved the road. And in the process, I think we paved over the formica nest. And I think when that formica nest was basically made defunct, uh, the polyergists went because they didn't have their workers. Or it was that chicken, maybe. Uh, chicken. That <laughs> chicken. <laughs> yes. How, how typically do you are the nests? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that well either, except we dug a whole bunch of them up when I was younger. I, uh, but they were not like Atta. Atta, the leaf cutter ant, could, uh, would not easily fit in this room. You know, because those are huge nests, like house-sized nests. These are much more, much smaller than that. We were able to dig them out in like a meter, uh, a meter deep, and maybe three meters wide, something like that. It's also much rockier soil around here. Yes. Hey. Is there a difference in the population? The question is, is there a difference in the population of the red ants and the black ants? That's a great question if you think about it. What is the general principle, folks, about predators and prey, or about parasites and hosts? What would we anticipate in terms of numbers of parasites compared to their their, their hosts, their specific hosts? More prey. We would, I'm sorry? Um, I'm sorry, more prey. They would probably need to be more formica nests than polyergists, because the form, the polyergist attacks the nest, but we never saw them attack the nest to the point of killing the nest, except in queen takeovers. When they would go in, they didn't take all the brood. They would take some of the brood. They didn't kill all the black ants. They killed a few, all the ones they needed to kill. I, 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 I don't know how to say that exactly. The ones they killed in order to get the job done. But, but the ant nest would persist for another few years. The black ant nest would persist for some some more years. So probably the answer to that question is more formica than polyergies. Good question. Yeah. The black ants that took the brood and escaped. Where did they go to? They would go for the hit, like up to the rocks, out into the bushes, and after the raid would come back. They would come. They would come back. back. They would come back and bring back the brood. That's what I thought. Thank you. So you got that question? What happens when the black ants were taking their own brood away in a form of escape from the raid? What happened after the raid ended? They came back with their brood, re-entered the nest, and presumably tried to, to make the most of it. Is this behavior peculiar just to these ants, or does this behavior occur in other species? And first of all, where did they learn all this? <laughs> this, this might be out of my jurisdiction here. Uh, the question is, has this behavior, brood parasitism, been found in other species? And the answer is, within the ant world, there are about 50 or more examples of this, only four of which are of the genera polyergis. It's a, as far as I know, worldwide. But we know of other brood parasites, of course, in the, in the animal kingdom, uh, the cuckoo and the and the cowbird are brood parasites, if you think about it. So brood parasitism is, is something that's done, but they've got their own, the ants have their own special uh, twist to the story. Yes? Does the uh, polyergus uh, interact with the harvester ants at all? Do the polyergus interact with the harvester ants? Good question. I ne they lived close, and in fact, they had to pass, so just as an anecdote, the, the raids that I would follow passed through a very well-traveled Poganomermex harvester trail. Because remember those chickens? Those chickens have a lot of chicken food, and our Poganomermex are eating the chicken food. So they have a trail that goes up and down our stairs from nest to chicken coop, and it's continuous. Hundreds and hundreds of ants. They had to cross that. They, they had to cross that. And right where the nest was, where I was doing most of the photography, that's on the Poconomermix trail. I saw no uh, interaction whatsoever between Poconomermix and polyergists. By the way, 
Pogonomervix is starting to slow down in the afternoon. Polyergis is just picking up. All the raids are afternoon raids. Between 2 and 6 in the evening, that's consistent across polyergis. Important okay. question. Yes. Your daughter. Uh, hello, Shelly. Mm -hmm. How do we know that the scout is a scout before we pink it? We did, we did not know the scout was a scout before we painted it. Here's what we did. We were, well, here's what I did. I was walking around the circle looking for those ants, right? And any ant that came as far out as seven meters, we figured maybe it's a scout. So we painted it on the down, just um, on, the, on the chance that it was a scout. And if it lit later led a raid, we knew we were right. There were lots more ants painted than were actually in the event. Want to OK, yeah. So when you have ants that are coming in your house and they say, oh, use diatomaceous earth or use uh, cayenne pepper, is that just messing with their scouting scouts? You know, I suspect that this, they're probably quite sensitive uh, to, their bodies are quite sensitive to such uh, kind of rough stuff. It either cuts up, as you were suggesting, the diatomaceous earth might cause a, a cut. Once an exoskeleton is pierced, that animal is doomed. So they don't want to have an exoskeleton pierced. Uh, they also might not like it. Uh, but, you know, we don't know because we're an equal opportunity home. And any, an, any animal that wants to live with us is welcome. So I have never tried those things. So I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, I read a paper about slave rebellions. Is slavery ants? Have you seen any examples of that? I've never heard of that. Really? Wow. Google Scholar. Yeah, yeah, I'll check it out. But did you hear that? They, uh, the argument was to use the vernacular, the old language, uh, a slave rebellion. They don't know they're slaves. Yeah. Right. I, yeah, I would be curious about that, but I'll, I'll look it up. But I, but my first thought would be that that's their home, right? And so, what would it look like? So I'm curious. I no, I haven't was, heard. I know it was based on pheromones, but I'm pretty sure it was ants in South America. So they have a different structure. In South America, everything's upside down and backwards. So <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, one more question. The only question I have is, oh, is the um, we see like javelina populations growing because we have decimated mountain lion populations. So does the, the amount of construction that is taking place, what's the effect and the long term downside, for example, of that? The question is that humans have impacted uh, interactions, mm -hmm. ecological interactions for quite some time. Now with our more mechanized, more concentrated efforts, for example, construction, the question is, how is that possibly affecting these organisms? Um, it, it's got to be messing with them, but ants are, Bob said it earlier, yeah. if anybody can handle it, it's the ants and the, and the bacteria and the cockroaches. And, I mean, so they'll do OK, at least as a group. but. Uh, with Pocono Mermex, they, they need a lot of uh, terrain. They are constantly out there <coughs> harvesting their seeds. You've seen the, the deforested circles around their nests. Uh, if uh, all of that gets dug up and, and is problematic. The fire ants, though, uh, are probably the opposite story. They're the ones messing with the construction, not the reverse. <laughs> and so that's a whole other ballgame. <laughs> All right, would you all join me in giving a <laughs> well, Thank you all for coming out. You're welcome to go into the gallery, chat with Peter, or just chat with one another. Thanks again. Hey, one last slide. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you.